Good morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business, and I am pleased to welcome you all to the 2022 Mason Public Leadership Lecture with Ms. Jan Cooper, the President and CEO of Journey Forward Strategies, LLC. This lecture is part of the Terry Leadership Speaker Series, which has brought many distinguished speakers from public and private sectors to our campus to both educate and to inspire our students. Today's honored speaker, Shan Cooper, will participate in a discussion that's moderated by Catherine Shi, who is a Leonard Leadership Scholar. We are fortunate to have the namesake of the Mason Public Leadership Lecture with us this morning. Keith Mason is a loyal University of Georgia alumnus who has served as a trustee of the University of Georgia Foundation for over a decade. This lecture reflects uh, one of Keith's passions and an essential component of the UGA experience, public leadership. He shares my belief that this university, the birthplace of public higher education in America, has a responsibility to produce outstanding leaders for our state, our nation, and our world. Through attention and action, true public leaders demonstrate that success in their fields is also defined by the contribution they make to others. We are indebted to Keith and his wife Twinker for their generosity in supporting this lecture series and for all they do for the University of Georgia. We are so glad that you were with us today. <laughs> Following today's discussion, Keith will offer some concluding remarks. I'd also like to welcome a number of special friends of the University of Georgia and the Terry College of Business. This morning, former Chancellor of the University System of Georgia, Steve Wrigley, is with us. Executive Chairman of Synovus and former Regent of the University System of Georgia, Kessel Stelling, is also with us. And last, Chair of the University of Georgia Foundation, Neil Quirk, is also with us. Please join me in welcoming them as well. At this time, I'd like to introduce an outstanding student at the University of Georgia, Abby Smith, who will introduce Shan Cooper. Abby is a management and finance student from Roswell, Georgia. She's also pursuing a personal and organizational leadership certificate as a leadership fellow from Institute of Leadership Advancement. Please join me in welcoming Abby. Thank you, Dean Ayers. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Shan Cooper. She is the founder and CEO of Journey Forward Strategies, a solutions-focused consulting firm that specializes in leadership development and organization effectiveness. She also serves as CEO. Prior to founding Journey Forward Strategies, Ms. Cooper served as the executive director for the Atlantic Committee for Progress for three years, with a mission to provide leadership on key issues to economic growth and inclusion for all citizens in the city of Atlanta. She is the former Chief Transformation Officer of West Rock and was responsible for developing infrastructure capabilities and system processes needed for business growth in a fast-paced merger and acquisition environment. Prior to joining West Rock, Ms. Cooper served as the Vice President and General Manager of Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company and simultaneously served as the Vice President of Business Ethics for the Aeronautics Division. During her tenure at Lockheed Martin, she served as Vice President of Human Resources for Lockheed Martin Corporate, as well as the Aeronautics and Information Systems and Global Divisions. In addition, she served as the first Corporate Vice President of Diversity and Equal Opportunity Programs. Ms. Cooper has received many distinguished awards. In 2021, she was awarded the Atlanta Business Chronicles Women of Influence Lifetime Achievement Award. She was also named Georgia Trend Magazine's 2015 Most Respected Business Leader and the 2015 Woman of the Year by the American Association of University Women. She was one of Georgia Trend Magazine's 100 Most Influential Georgians from 2012 to 2016, and again in 2020 and 2021. From 2019 to 2021, she was one of Atlanta Business Chronicle's Power 100. In addition, in 2017, she was named one of Black Enterprise Magazine's most powerful executives in corporate America. Ms. Cooper serves on the board of directors for the following corporations. Georgia Power Company, Intercontinental Exchange Incorporated, South State Corporation, and Veritiv Corporation. In addition, she serves on the board of directors for Grady Health System, the board of trustees for Emory University, the board of the Georgia Tech Research Institute, Georgia Historical Society, Georgia Music Accord, and Zoo Atlanta. She's also a member of the Atlanta Rotary Club and a life member of the Board of Counselors for the Carter Center. 
Ms. Cooper earned a bachelor's degree in biology and religion from Emory University and a master of business administration from the Roberto Guaysueta Business School of Emory University. In addition, she holds an executive master's degree in global human resources from Rutgers University. It goes without saying that we are incredibly lucky to have the chance to hear from Ms. Shan Cooper this morning. Please join me in welcoming today's speaker. Good morning. Ooh, my microphone works. I was afraid that it didn't, but it does. Good morning, and welcome to the Mason Public Leadership Lecture Series. My name is Katherine Shi. I'm a Leonard Leadership Scholar majoring in Finance, Management Information Systems, and International Business. Thank you so much for being here, and I'm really looking forward to facilitating today's discussion with Ms. Cooper. So starting off, before we get into the questions, will you tell us a little bit about your background? Wonderful, glad to do so. First of all, let me just say good morning again to everyone and how delighted and excited I am to be here with you all today. So I've done a little bit of everything, Catherine, in my career. My first job out of college, believe it or not, I was a bank teller. Thank God that didn't last. Uh, and then I actually did some consulting. I uh, recognized that was not the career for me. I didn't like the traveling every week. Uh, I wanted to be home to be at family events. Uh, and then I've done, as, as you heard Abby talk about, I worked at Lockheed Martin, spent most of my career in human resources, got a chance to do some operational work, uh, transitioned to West Rock, did some work there, and then got a chance to work the Atlanta Committee for Progress. So I found a little bit of a lot of different things. Uh, even during my tenure at Lockheed Martin, uh, it was, a, you know, again, working for different organizations, different departments, what have you. But uh, so I've had a chance to do a little bit of a, a, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. Um, definitely as a finance major have looked into consulting and banking, yes. so that's awesome to hear that you were able to do both. Um, so during your earlier tenure at Lockheed Martin, you served as the VP of Human Resources for Corporate mm -hmm. Aeronautics and Information Systems and Global Solutions. Mm -hmm. So in this role, you led the operational aspects of the human resource function for more than 54,000 employees in over 1,000 locations in more than 60 countries. How did you adapt to so many business cultures, so many different people um, that you were dealing with? So first of all, I had a wonderful team. As you can imagine, it's hard to be in over 60 you know, countries mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, but I had a wonderful team. And for me as a leader, it's always about having good people around you. Uh, so I had a wonderful team, but we also spent a lot of time at Lockheed Martin actually learning about different cultures. So it was like going, you guys got a class here? I was going to class in Lockheed Martin. Uh, I'll tell you the most interesting transition, however, happened uh, when I transitioned from the human resources role over to being the first woman to lead uh, Lockheed Martin Aeronautics building military aircraft and weapon systems here in Georgia. Uh, I walked into that role being known as an HR leader. That's how everybody knew me across in, in, within the company. And I will admit everybody in the free world knew I had never built a military aircraft or a weapon system. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't hide that. Uh, and so, but walking into that role, I also recognized that probably some of my Middle Eastern customers were not going to be used to coming to receive their aircraft and have a woman greet them as the leader. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I hired a wonderful protocol officer. And this is the first probably in our company, but I really wanted someone to tell me what I needed to do to be effective in the job. And so she would tell me, Shan, we've got this, this customer coming this week. You can't wear that color. You can't outreach your hand. You've got to do certain things. Um, and to me, that was important. It was important that my customer felt comfortable coming to engage with me, but I knew coming into our facility, they were not going to be expecting to see me, one, a woman, and then secondly, a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ensure that they were comfortable. And so just as you all are continuing to learn here at UGA, you never stop learning. Uh, and so I was always in a, in a classroom setting or in somewhere where I was learning different cultures of, of folks around the world. Mm -hmm. And I expected, you know, my, my team did the same thing. And it was fun for us. Yeah. Uh, but just wanted to be real careful as we engage with different people around, around the world. Definitely. It's important. That's very interesting to hear that because when you are thrown into so many different business environments, being able to adapt and understanding someone else's culture is definitely difficult at times. Absolutely. And it's amazing to hear that you had the experience to do that. Um, so in an interview with Georgia Tech, you had stated that when you were at Lockheed Martin, you were typically in meetings um, where you were the only woman and sometimes the only woman of color. So what were some of the challenges specifically in that meeting environment in that workplace? Right, you know, it was interesting. Um, I never had the issue of, um, I think, being 
the only woman. That never stood out for me. Um, because one, I was probably overly prepared for like every meeting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to ensure that I didn't know everything, but I was going to be as prepared as, prepared as I could be. Um, the most interesting thing that happened to me, and I share this story, because I know that many of you, as you enter the workforce, you're gonna engage with different people, people much different than yourselves, and be open to that, be open to that. But I can remember one day, I was at the facility there, and I, had, I was in a training class, and at this point, I was just the HR leader there at the, at the plant, and so, um, I went to, we had a break, I went to use the restroom, and it was just a maze to me in this place. So I couldn't find my way back to the training room. I finally did, and I was late. And the one thing I hate being is late. I just really, I'm just real respectful of people's time. So I walked in, and I apologized uh, to the instructor, said I apologized for being late, I couldn't find the restroom. And one of my classmates said, well, that's because women should be at home. And so I took that in, and I sat back and I looked at the person who made the comment. And so in just a few seconds, I said, you know what? Uh, this is an older gentleman. Uh, probably in his lifetime, um, he probably didn't have very many women who were in the workplace, right? So I had to recognize that. Um, but I decided that I wouldn't, uh, trust me, the, the instructor is having a stroke. He's nervous, he doesn't know what I'm gonna do because he knows I'm HR, right? Uh, he knows I could fire this person right then on the spot. But what I said to the gentleman, and I said it openly in front of the class and everybody, I said, well, um, do you have daughters? And he said, well, yes, I, I do. Mm -hmm. I said, well, wouldn't you want your daughter to be able to find the restroom if they had to use the restroom? And he kind of looked at me and he sat back. And he didn't say anything. He said it to be a joke. I understood that. But I wanted to make it a teachable moment. Uh, one, for him to think twice when you say things like that, uh, but number two, I wanted the class to hear me say that to him as well. So after the break, he comes over and he apologizes. And so when I tell, you know, I would, you know, tell my, my colleagues what happened, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you didn't just fire him right there. I can't believe you, you know, how dare he, blah, blah, blah. But I just believe that we need to show each other grace. And so I decided that day I would show him just a little bit of grace, not fire him, right? But just have him to understand that when you say things, all things aren't funny, right? And be careful, because I love having fun. Anybody who knows will tell you, I, wanna, I think we should laugh every day, all day if we can. Uh, but at least once a day, we should be laughing and excited about something. Uh, but I made that a teachable moment, and I, and I decided to do this. But I recognize that all of us come from different places in life, uh, and so we come with different perspectives. Our experiences are very different, right? And so recognizing that, I took the time to breathe, uh, show a little bit of grace, but also kind of make it more teachable for him. And he came and he apologized. He said, I was really trying to be funny. And I said, I, I recognize that. Uh, but I didn't receive it as funny. Mm -hmm. And you probably shouldn't do that. And so he, he, he recognized it was the wrong thing to do. And so I just believe in showing people grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So would you say that in that moment, um, you definitely had a moment where you were kind of thinking about your values and thinking about the mission of Lockheed Martin and what you represented as someone who works in HR. Um, so in that moment, you know, you're in a position where you're leading people and you're setting an example for people. Um, how do you stay committed to that mission and that vision? And how do you, you know, stick with those values even in difficult times like that? Right, well, life is gonna be, it's gonna be challenging, right? It's just life, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been demoted, I've been um, not given a job that I felt that I was more than qualified to do. I mean, I have all these things happen, right? Uh, but you keep going. And it really is about your personal values. So uh, I grew up in a home where my dad's a pastor. So my upbringing was very different than most. Um, our values in the house were, you know, uh, integrity. You always told the truth. Even if you're going to get in trouble. One reason you always told the truth, and my dad said he never said this, but I just remember somebody telling me that liars will burn in hell, right? And so I'm like, I don't want to burn in hell, right? Uh, and so, uh, but I remember that. My dad said he never said that to me, but, uh, but, but integrity was huge in our home. So you always told the truth. Uh, love of people, regardless of how they're packaged, you know, regardless of the color of your skin, you know, as my, my dad would say, you know, we're all God's creation, right? Uh, respect for people. Uh, so these were, these were things that I grew up doing my entire life. Mm -hmm. And so there's a personal set of values. And then I happened to work for organizations who had other values that were really important to me as well. As a matter of fact, the idea of respecting others was a shared value. Lockheed Martin had three values, do the right thing, respect others, and perform with excellence. I still remember them today because we lived those values and, because, and they were personal to me. 
And so as you talked about our values as a company there, when that incident happened, um, I went first to my own personal values, right? Uh, this is a human. Um, it, this is a moment that I can help him be better uh, and not do this again or say things like this again. Uh, but that's where I typically start. So I try to manage the emotion. You, you guys, I'm sure you, you talk about and you hear a lot about emotional intelligence, right? Um, and I try to manage the, the emotions uh, and then take the appropriate action. Mm -hmm. So I try to think, breathe, do that first before I just speak mm -hmm. and it helps. But the value system is really, really important. Yeah, definitely. We as um, scholars, we just did an assessment on emotional intelligence. So Good. it's really interesting that you <laughs> brought that up. Um, but you had mentioned previously that some of your values are always telling the truth and being mm -hmm. honest. Um, so when you're working as the chief transformation officer of West Rock Company, how did the ESG implementation or talk of that affect your role and how did you overcome any obstacles during your time in this role? Yeah, so being a chief transformation officer, your job is really about change. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really important that you're a good communicator in that role, in those kinds of roles, because you're making decisions that's gonna impact people's lives. So if people will either come and you know, go on the journey with you or they'll, what people call resist the change, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had to make some really tough decisions. Mm -hmm. um, some facilities were not going to remain open, mm -hmm. um, so, which meant that some community was going to be impacted, right? Mm -hmm. And so my role, I think you know, in, in that process, it was very important to me that I brought people along the journey that people fully understood why decisions were being made. Mm -hmm. So I don't think people just naturally resist change. I think they really want to understand how is this change going to impact me personally. Mm -hmm. And if you can get people there, they may not always like it, but they will at least appreciate also that you took the time to help them kind of get through the change. Mm -hmm. And so that, that particular job, you know, West Rock was a company that was growing tremendously fast you know, with m and activity. When I was there for three years, we, we acquired 13 companies, divested two, and formed a joint venture in New Mexico with another company. Mm -hmm. So it was a very fast-paced company. Many of the companies we were purchasing were very small, uh, what we called mom-and-pop operations in very small communities. So to go into the community and saying you're going to close this facility had real implications for people's lives. Mm -hmm. I was always mindful of that. If there was ever a way that I could find a way to reposition of decision of closure versus that, then I worked to do that first, mm -hmm. uh, but oftentimes you couldn't do that. And so when you're making those decisions, it's very important that you're open and you're honest with people, uh, that they can make decisions for their families. And that was the way I tried to approach that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually worked for a company that did M&A this past summer, and a huge part of it was, um, you know, when they uh, take in synergies, they mm -hmm. lay off people, and he was definitely like making sure to tell them and be really honest. So that's really cool that you also shared those same values. Yes. Um, so moving on to the next question. So you were retired from West Rock, um, enjoying your life on the beach, and you received a phone call from members of the executive committee for the Atlanta Committee for Progress. They asked you to be the executive director, and initially you said no. Um, so tell me about being brought out of retirement and what pulled you back? Oh my goodness. I'm not your model for retirement, so don't let me be your role model for that. Um, what brought me out of retirement to do that role was a statistic. We had brought um, McKinsey Consulting in to really do a study of Atlanta. Uh, we were hearing that we were the poorest city in the country. We just didn't believe it. Because if you looked at the skyline, the skyline was growing. We had you know, people coming in, um, lots of companies bringing in their headquarters here. Um, and so we're like, well, you know, something's going on here because we don't see what people are, are saying. Uh, what we recognize is that we were absolutely the poorest city in the country uh, when it came to uh, economic mobility. But we were also uh, recognizing not everybody was participating in the prosperity of Atlanta. But the one statistic that got me to come from the beach was um, if you are a child, this was back in 2018, if you are a child born in poverty in the city of Atlanta, you had a 4.8% chance of getting out of poverty unless something was done directly to impact your life. Hearing that statistic about children who would never have an opportunity, uh, having grown up poor myself, uh, I knew I couldn't know that and not do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so that was what got me to yes. They sent me the data. And so I'm a big data geek. And uh, seeing that particular statistic said to me, I had to come back, leave the beach. The beach was in Destin, by the way. It's a great beach. Uh, and come back to work. So I did. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, it's super inspirational to know you being in the business industry and being in there for so long that you always do put people first. 
Um, I know that there was a quote um, in the, I might be saying this wrong, but in the U.S. Army where um, it's the U.S. Army motto of mission first, people always. So what does that mean to you? Yes. And that was actually my guiding principle. So when I transitioned from human resources to take on the operations role, uh, building military aircraft and weapon systems, I wanted people to understand my view of how I wanted to run the facilities. So I had three facilities across three different states, about 8,100 employees. Um, and so mission first, people always became my guiding principle. Mm -hmm. And what I meant by that was, listen, we're here to fulfill a mission um, democracy was what we all talked a lot about. We talked a lot about freedom, uh, as Lockheed Martin, uh, but we talked more about our purpose. And I really worked hard, went on my little purpose journey to talk to people about why do you come to work here every day? Mm -hmm. Tell me why it's important that you're here every day. And as I gathered all that information, what it really came down to is that the fact that our purpose here, our mission, was to deliver zero defect aircraft and weapon systems. That was the mission. But our purpose was to bring the warfighter back to his or her family every time they touched our aircraft or our mm -hmm. weapon systems. And that we took that to heart, and it meant something to us. And so whenever there were disputes about what should happen around a particular resource, a particular product, what have you, I'd go back and say, well, does that impact the mission, the mission in a positive way? Does it align with our purpose? Uh, and it made decision making easier for me, but more importantly, it made decision making easier for the folks, because I couldn't be at three plants, plants at the same time in three different states. Mm -hmm. But people knew um, that if I make this decision, because I believed in decision at the lowest point of impact, uh, that I'm going to be okay, because Shan would recognize and understand it's aligned with the mission and aligns with our purpose. Mm -hmm. But where I recognize too that you can't do the mission or purpose without the right people. People in the right jobs, at the right time, doing the right things, right? And so uh, mission first, people always became my guiding principle. Uh, my leaders lived up to that, and then we were able to get a lot of things done. As a matter of fact, by the time I left, uh, we were actually delivering zero defect aircraft, which is unheard of in the aerospace industry, but my team was doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So in that situation where you're brainstorming ways to solve a problem, and, mm -hmm. but as a leader, you actually have to make the decision. Mm -hmm. have there ever, has there ever been any difficulties with having contradicting opinions to reach a decision, and how do you navigate that? Oh, not in my life, no, you can right? <laughs> <laughs> I worked with engineers and scientists, they always had the answer, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, so I'll give you, tell you a quick story. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point about decisions and how all values and purpose, how it all plays together. So I'm actually visiting another facility with my boss, mm -hmm. and I get a call from my customer saying to me, for this particular aircraft, Shan, we're, I'm thinking I'm going to shut down your production line, uh, and we're not going to do test flights on your aircraft. Uh, well, the last thing you ever want to happen, have happen when you're in manufacturing is to have your production shut down. It costs a lot of money, uh, and it gets you a lot of uh, attention when the customer has to do that. So at Lockheed Martin, we were what you call a GOCO. So it means that that, that that plant was Air Force plant number six. It was a GOCO in that it was government owned, but contractor operated. So we were the contractor operating Air Force plant number six for the Air Force. And when I got this call from my customer, I said to him, I'm sure I was begging, pleading, um, you know, sir, if you'll just give me a chance, this is my base commander, uh, if you'll just give me a chance to get back in town, I will be in your office Monday morning mm -hmm. with the solution. Uh, I'll also have an understanding, uh, you know, a summary for you of what occurred, uh, but please don't shut down my manufacturing line. Mm -hmm. And he paused and he said to me, okay, um, I'm being advised differently uh, by my team here. They want you to want me to shut you down, but I'm going to give you to Monday, Shan. And I'm going to give you to Monday because you've always been a woman of your word. And so you've gotten to Monday morning. I left where I was traveling to that day, told my boss what was going on, said, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted. I got back to the site, and on my way, I'm, of course, I'm on the phone on the way back, and I'm asking, you know, and my team would tell you, um, working for me, uh, I have high standards of excellence, mm -hmm. um, but I don't raise my voice. Uh, I typically do everything with a smile, but if they were on stage today, they would tell you, they could always tell though when I was upset, because my question would be, how did we get here? And so I was asking, how did we get here? And, but I said to the group, I said, I want a meeting when I get back to the, to the facility, but I don't want to meet with 
the supervisors. I want to meet with them. I need to meet with the mechanics. Well, that was a shock to the system because um, my managers, my leaders expected me to meet with them to find the solution. Mm -hmm. But I knew the solution was with the mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. And so we got into a room. I set the table with the mechanics. My leaders stood along the sides of the wall and they walked me through the issue of what had occurred. And unfortunately, it was a very serious issue. I mean, we could have lost lives that day. And so um, we came up with a solution, we determined how it wouldn't happen again. And what I recognized that my leaders were there and I still needed them to be able to lead, right? So I couldn't come in and just be the all powerful and whatever. I had to put them back in a position of power, right? Because I needed them to lead every day. So I met with them afterwards and said, listen, I needed to hear from the source what happened. One, because I'm on a time crunch. I had to be in the you know, commander's office on Monday morning. Yeah. Um, but what I want, I need to give you all some feedback. And the feedback is this, I need you listening. I need you listening to the mechanics. Because what they just said to me is the same things they could have said to you all. And I wouldn't be in the position where I've got to go to the principal's office on Monday morning, because that's what it felt like. Um, and so we worked our way through that. Making it real clear to the, to the mechanics, thank you, I appreciate you all, continue to make great decisions. Um, and I always had an open door policy, but you couldn't come to my open door to complain about management, or whatever. That, that's HR's job, right? Mm -hmm. But there are things going on, I wanted people to be comfortable coming to me, bringing me the good, bad, and the ugly. And my team did that. Mm -hmm. And so that was probably the one time that we had a differing point of view in terms of how I handled and how I managed the situation, but it got us to the right outcome. Mm -hmm. And it actually changed from that point on. It began to change the culture of how we operated. And there was a lot more listening happening uh, across the three facilities, right? People were listening more to the folks who were doing the work because they had the answer, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's amazing to hear that in a business where there is a hierarchical stru structure yeah. and you have people above you and people below you that you were able to make a change and say, hey, this is not how we're gonna do this, this isn't working, mm -hmm. um, and breaking that. So when it comes to like business culture and finding a way to restructure business culture, have mm -hmm. you found that there's a specific method that's most beneficial, or like what have you learned from you know, being able right. to do that? Well, there's a great book um, that I use as my framework called Change the Culture, Change the Game. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's about getting the results you want to get uh, from a business process or what have you, but by leveraging the culture. A couple of things have to happen, right? First, there has to be a shared belief system, right? Shared purpose, shared what we believe. Uh, there also has to be a mechanism for giving and receiving feedback. Mm -hmm. And a lot of organizations, that's where they miss the boat because people aren't comfortable giving other people feedback. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's one area that you guys will work on in ILA. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's a tool that you'll need to use. And so uh, I've always been one to give feedback. And people will be like, okay, I, and I'll ask you, hey, can I, do I have permission to give you feedback? Because mm -hmm. feedback is a tool that makes you better, right? Um, now, not all feedback is good feedback, not all feedback is positive, and you'll assess that. But when you've got a, you've got a culture where people can openly do that, uh, we openly did that. And, and you need, and because lives were at stake in the work that we did, right, you really did have, need to have a culture where people can kind of speak their truth, mm -hmm. uh, and there'd be no retribution for that. And that was how we operated, but we had to work at that. And I had to lead by example, right? And so I would, in my meetings by saying, I remember the first time I did it, I, in my meetings by saying, okay team, what feedback do you have for me? Not if you have feedback or whatever, what feedback do you have for me? Mm -hmm. And the first time I did it, they kind of looked at me like, okay, she can't be serious. She, she really wants to give her feedback. And I absolutely did. Uh, and oftentimes as a leader, I mean, you have blind spots because you're not, you don't have people you know, being able and willing to give you feedback when you absolutely need it as a leader as well. And so um, that would be, that's a great book, again, that I have used in my career. When it came to, again, changing and addressing issues around culture and how we operate and how we work together. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so would you say that in that scenario where you are taking feedback, would you say that it's also impacted how you decide how, what kind of legacy you want to leave and how you set an example for others? Yes. So the feedback, again, when you ask for feedback, you've got to be willing to act on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the feedback has been good for me in my career because oftentimes as a leader, uh, you think you're doing all the right things. 
uh, the reality is you're missing some stuff because there are some data points that you don't have. Uh, but I would say absolutely uh, in that process of getting feedback, I'm always mindful of, okay, uh, I've heard what this individual has said. Now, how am I going to demonstrate that I've heard, right? What am I going to, how am I going to behave differently so they know that I heard and that I'm listening? And that was important to me. Mm -hmm. And so I would say absolutely yes. It has definitely shaped me to be a much, much stronger leader mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. So you've also spoken about how sometimes when you are put in that leadership position, um, you've switched many roles and you've mm -hmm. been in many positions. So how do you know when to leave an organization and move on to another company? Right. So my, my thing is this. So I live my life on assignment. So this is, this is that, probably that, that growing up, how I grew up, right, with a dad as a pastor. Um, I tend to um, know when I'm not learning anything new, right, mm -hmm. it's time for me to probably go do something else. Um, or when I feel that um, I'm, I'm, I'm bored, I'm not give, I'm, I'm, I can't make an impact that I like to see, like, I, I feel like I need to be making, uh, that's usually a symbol for me that it's time for me to go do something else. Um, leaving Lockheed Martin was probably uh, the change that I made in my career that probably shocked the people the most mm -hmm. because nobody ever expected me to leave Lockheed Martin. Uh, but I had moved 10 times, relocated my family 10, I'm not 10 times, relocated my family four times in 10 years. Uh, and I'd always lived my life, you know, faith, family, and then career. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband is an attorney, so he had a career, I had a career, but we had agreed that my career would lead. And so whenever I, we get to move, I'd say, honey, we're moving again. You know, he said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna call the realtor, we're gonna sell the house. Um, but I'm just being real careful about um, that I've got a piece about leaving. Uh, and so when I announced that I was leaving Lockheed Martin, like I said, it was a shock to the system because uh, I was a high potential talent there and probably had a much higher trajectory in front of me. Uh, but I knew it was time for me to transition to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, my intent at the time was to retire. Uh, I ended up being retired for a weekend. Mm -hmm. And then I went to work for West Rock um, that Monday when I left Lockheed that Friday, which was not a smart thing to do. Uh, but I did it uh, to go help a friend at West Rock. Um, but you just know, I just know for me when it's time for me to, to make a new decision about my career, but I definitely have to be continuously learning something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And as a leader, you're often probably expected to be perfect in these organizations and in these roles, um, which is an unreasonable expectation for a person. So how have you managed these expectations? Yes, so as a leader, I mean, they, there is this, ex and actually we put a lot of the pressure on ourselves, believe it or not, right? We, you know, we expect ourselves, I'm in this job, I've got this title, I've got to have all the answers. The reality is we never, you'll never have everything you need to know as a leader. I mean, my stance was always, I kind of use a Colin Powell model. If I had 70% of the data, the information, then I'd make the decision, what have you. And I tell my team, listen, you know, I'm the accountable executive, so as long as it's not immoral, unethical, and nobody dies, um, then we can fix it. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, at the end of the day, in, in, in any aspect, I'm still the accountable executive at the end of the day. And so um, I take a lot of pressure off my, I would take a lot of pressure off myself. And I think going into a job where I knew very little uh, caused me to have to rely on my team a lot uh, and put the right people in places and in the right jobs that I could trust to get things done. And so it relieved a lot of pressure off, off of me to have to be perfect, to have to have the answers for everything. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say trust the team, get a good team around you and just trust the team that they're gonna do what they, what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when it comes to like learning who to trust and when to delegate work, mm -hmm. what is something that you've learned in this process? Yeah. So usually going into every new job, I've always looked for what I called my trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the person I could ask the dumb questions to and it would show up in the newspaper. Uh, this was a person that I could trust um, with, with, with anything and everything. And so I'll give an example. When I, the day I walked into the job as the, um, the new operations leader um, you know, for the operation, the aeronautics operation, um, there was a newspaper on my desk. The local newspaper had interviewed one of my employees who had talked about how the plant now was going to fail, uh, how they had put someone who wasn't qualified to do the job in the role. I mean, it was a horrible interview. Um, I left that newspaper on my desk for at least six months. And I thought, I've got to find someone who can teach me how we build aircraft. Because I didn't know. I mean, that's being real candor, right? So part of the article was true. 
But I knew I brought something else to the, to the game, right? I knew I was a good strategist. I knew I was good with people. I knew I had a good, strong financial background, like you have, Catherine. And so, um, and so I knew what I brought to the table. But at this point, people needed to know, though, that I knew how to run this thing, that I was going to be good with our customers, I was going to be good in Washington, I was going to be good with the congressional, that they needed to have confidence in me. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, and, and, and I was, you know, really focused on it because I also recognized that they were counting on me to be able to care for their families, right? And so I had one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of my leaders. First, I had to talk to the folks who didn't get the job, right? Who thought they should have had the job. So I had to deal with that. But my next thing was to talk to my leaders and say, who's gonna be my trusted advisor? And uh, there was one young man, David Logan. David at that time was the director of production operations and he was kind of new to this particular role. Uh, maybe he got there six months before I did. And I'm talking mm -hmm. to David one day, and I, and I always start with people like, you know, tell me about you. Don't tell me about the job you do. I'll figure that out later. But tell me about you mm -hmm. as a person. And David says to me, he says, Shan, you're not going to believe this, by the way. I carry myself. We, we laugh. He said, but my dad's a pastor. And I thought, ding, 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 ding. I found my trusted advisor, right? Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, David, you're going to teach me how to rebuild aircraft. I said, because right now, I, I, need, I gotta know that. One, I gotta face a, a military aircraft customer here soon, right? And all these other things. And so every other Friday, we worked a 980 schedule, and every other Friday, David and I were at the plant, crawling through aircraft, doing all these things, and he was teaching me how we did what we do. Wow. And so you put the time in, you put the effort in, and about six months, I felt very strong in the role. I could go to, I could stand on my own, uh, there were times I had to tell my customer, don't know the answer to that question, but I'll get back to you. Um, and you never want to be in that position, but I, there I was, right? But I wasn't going to try to fake it. Uh, but I was confident that I was the right leader for the role. Um, I was going to learn the job, and I did. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, for me, it's always been finding that trusted advisor. I knew I could ask David anything, and it wasn't going to end up back in the newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so, but that was my motivator. That newspaper article was my, my motivation to keep going. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the characteristics you just mentioned are humility, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes um, and learn from people, no matter what backgrounds they're from, Absolutely. no matter what position they're in, um, and your drive, like your willingness to learn and your willingness to take a step back and be like, wait, I don't know this, mm -hmm. and I need to figure out what this is. Right. Um, those are some of the essential characteristics that we're taught, um, but what do you think are ways in which some of us could develop these characteristics or some, something that you, you know, has helped you develop them? Right. So I, th I think it's just not having a fear of the unknown, right? And taking on the assignments that, um, that people tend to not want to, want to do. Um, so I haven't always, I mean, I have these wonderful, wonderful opportunities, but the roles haven't always been, you know, glamorous and glorious, whatever. I mean, I've had to fire people, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've had to, again, you know, work with leaders, you know, closing facilities. Mm -hmm. um, so I've done that part of my job that I didn't like as much. Mm -hmm. um, and so but I would say for you all for right now, though, I mean, take on something different. Do, take on a different assignment, something you've never done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I did when I was in college, uh, I have, actually have a degree in religion. And I did that. I studied religion because, religions of the world, because I had grown up in one faith. And I wanted to understand other faiths. I mean, so there had to be something beyond what I had learned in my, in my life. Mm -hmm. And I loved it because the experience, uh, I got a chance to, you know, to go to a Catholic mass. I never would have had a chance to do that otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. um, I went to a, a Buddhist temple. I got a chance to just experience um, these different faiths. And so I would say now is the time for you just be experimental. Uh, do things that you wouldn't normally do, right? Mm -hmm. And put yourself in those uncomfortable situations uh, so you're able to deal with that when it hits you during your career. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome advice. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all the time we have okay. for questions right now, so we'll sure. take some questions from the mm -hmm. audience. Hi. On it. Okay. Um, my name is Natalie Harper. I am a third year marketing major. I'm also part of the Leadership Fellows Program. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for being here today. But also, um, managing thousands of employees, you've definitely had to address a lot of internal conflict um, you know, with people within your organizations. What's normally your first step when you're addressing conflicts? Right. First step is listening, being a good listener. Uh, so you can understand where truth is. Uh, and oftentimes as a leader, you're put in that position where you have to be the assessor of where truth lies. 
Um, I ask a lot of questions, uh, but at the end of the day, I'm looking for a solution or a way to get to an, a, an answer uh, to the problem that's really going to resolve the conflict, put us in a position where it doesn't happen again, um, and try to, sometimes you can't get there, most of the times you can, but then as a leader, it becomes your call. And then I go back to what are our values and what's our purpose, right? Is there alignment there? And then you make the decision. But it starts first with just listening. Sometimes people just want to be heard and listened to. And so um, I just recall in my HR, being a human resources professional, where a lot of that role was just that. It was just listening and being able to ask the right questions uh, so you could fully understand the situation or what was happening. Um, when you work with, with 8,100 people, or you, 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 know, you guys probably even see it in your classes today, right? There's going to be conflict. There's going to be different points of view. Um, innovation is, is a good place to have different points of view, but you can't allow it to, to paralyze the process or the work to be done. And so I'd say start with being a, big, a good communicator, listening and asking smart questions. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, I see a hand right here. Hi, my name is David Smore. I'm a third year finance student. Um, when you were working for Lockheed Martin and you were meeting clients from other countries and yeah. different cultures, do you have an interesting story that you'd like to share from that time? Because I'm sure it's a pretty interesting experience. <laughs> yes, so um, I had a Middle Eastern customer come, and when they come for the aircraft, their flight crews come as well, right? And so there's a clear line of command, right? But you gotta know that, right? And when the, um, for, the, 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 for the crew that was coming to fly the aircraft away, uh, this is why it was so important that I have a protocol officer. I had, got, I had in the right color that day, uh, but somehow I forgot that I could not extend my hand to the crewman because he was single and apparently they couldn't touch a woman, right? And so we've got this awkward moment where, um, and you know, you do these wonderful ceremonies, they're just really extravagant, right? Um, and so I'm, my hand's just kind of hanging out there. And so I just kind of just stretch it, you know? Um, mm, you know, you just stretch it out, what have you, and just continue to talk to someone else, whatever. Um, that may be small for us, but that was a religious right for, for him, right? I mean, I really could have really just done some horrible things. I don't know what would have happened when he had gotten back to his country. He probably had to, I don't know, isolate for a time period or whatever, but that really could have been a real disaster, right? And so um, I just made it the point every time, okay, who's coming next week, okay? Here's what I need to know. Here's what I can wear. Um, here's what I can't wear. Um, and typically on the flight line, uh, I always wore slacks. Um, but when I had certain guests coming in, I'd have a dress on. I just wouldn't go up, you know, on the aircraft, what have you. So it would change my schedule sometimes. It would change what I, what I had planned for the rest of the day or what have you. But it was important. Uh, but that was probably the one awkward moment. I just forgot. And I knew it, and I'm saying it to myself, you know, as I'm walking out to greet, you know, my customers, but I'm saying it to myself. Don't reach out and extend, you know. And even with the, with the folks who were in, in control, they had to extend their hand to me first. So I'm, I'm just, I just have to just kind of stand at attention. Um, but each customer kind of had their different thing. There were some, you know, Middle Eastern countries, they were excited that they were actually having women now be involved in, in life. You know, women were driving and things, things like that. And so, but I really had to keep in mind um, that I didn't do anything that was just stupid. And I'm so glad I didn't reach out and actually touch that gentleman because I don't know what would have occurred. But I knew it was, it was taboo for me to do that. And so I just exercised my arm. <laughs> Jan, thank you so much for being with us today and investing in our students. I had the pleasure of hearing her speak uh, last spring at a Terry event in Atlanta. And as I was hearing you speak, I was thinking about We've got to get you to campus to speak to our students here in Athens. So thank, thank you so much for thank being you. with us today. I've got a small token of oh, our thank appreciation. You. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Keith Mason, our sponsor, to join us and say a few concluding remarks.
Thank you, Dean. I want to thank uh, Shan Cooper and Catherine for a wonderful program. I also want to thank all the members of the ILA staff for helping put this together, uh, led by Laura Little, as well as uh, the folks from uh, Synovus, uh, uh, Kessel Stelling, who's here today, that uh, helped make it, make it happen. Uh, for, and I most importantly, want to thank all the students for being here. I think uh, this has been a wonderful program. Uh, Shan has uh, delivered a lot of great insights from her uh, career in business, and it is obvious why she was tapped by the leaders of, of Atlanta Committee for Progress to come out of retirement and to try to uh, uh, deploy those skills and, and leadership uh, to the work that she was doing on behalf of the, the community in, in Atlanta and as well as other corporations like Georgia Power and Intercontinental Exchange, which owns the New York Stock Exchange, by the way, have asked her to be on their boards to provide the kind of insights that she, that she has. Uh, thank all of you for being here. It's uh, uh, a beautiful day in Athens, and go dogs and beat Auburn. <laughs>